waters are fast moving. Unlike other big rallies, a bit earlier at about 7 a.m., a group from the Coast Guard. Today on Rappler, Typhoon Haiyan could be the strongest storm to hit the Philippines this year. More on the Disbursement Acceleration Program, a former congressman asks the Supreme Court to gag the president. And Saudi Arabia bans the return of deported foreign workers. Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rapper, your social news network. Local government units are on alert for what may be the strongest storm to hit the Philippines this year. Agencies in the Visayas, Northern Mindanao, and Southern Luzon are now deploying personnel and equipment as Typhoon Haiyan nears the Philippines. The typhoon is moving west-northwest at 30 kilometers per hour with maximum sustained winds of 175 kilometers per hour and gusts of up to 210 kilometers per hour. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says it's located 1,221 kilometers east of Mindanao. Once it enters the Philippine area of responsibility, it will take the name Yolanda. Forecast tracks show the typhoon will make landfall in the Samar Leyte area Friday afternoon. Its effects can be felt in the Visayas, northern parts of Mindanao, and southern parts of Luzon. Communication Secretary Sunny Coloma says provincial and municipal disaster councils are preparing to move residents out of flood-prone areas. Coloma says rescue boats, emergency relief, and medical supplies have been spread out to strategic areas. Bicol is now on red alert, with its six provincial disaster councils advised to start preemptive evacuations Thursday. Local officials in Region 7, the area hit by the magnitude 7.2 quake last October, are also preparing for the typhoon. Classes are suspended in all levels on Thursday and Friday in Cebu. The Cloban City will start preemptive evacuations for about 1,000 residents Wednesday night. In disaster-prone Philippines, the right information can save lives. A newly launched government website aims to help prevent casualties during disasters. On Wednesday, the Office of Civil Defense launches the Disaster Information for Nationwide Awareness website, or Project DINA, a one-stop shop for Filipinos to learn critical information on imminent disasters. The website has video clips of tips on what to do before, during, and after disasters like earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, typhoons, and floods. The National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council says the informational video clips will be shown in public places. Former Iloilo Representative Augusto Sihuko Jr. asks the Supreme Court to stop President Benigno Aquino and his officials from making public comments on the Disbursement Acceleration Program, or DAP, while a case is pending before the Supreme Court. Sihuko is one of the petitioners asking the court to declare the government spending program unconstitutional. There are at least eight petitions against DAP. Oral arguments are set on November 11th. In his manifestation, Sihuko says Aquino's primetime TV address defending DAP is, quote, a clear violation of the subjudice rule. Citing jurisprudence, Sihuko says the subjudice rule bars parties to a case from commenting on judicial proceedings to avoid prejudging the issue, influencing the court, or obstructing the administration of justice. Sihuko says Aquino was, quote, subtly exerting pressure on the Supreme Court by making the speech defending DAP. Sihuko adds, to ask the sentiment and approval of the public on the constitutionality of DAP by presenting the alleged benefits derived from it makes his speech in utter violation of the subjudice rule. In his speech, Aquino says DAP was legal and helped disaster preparedness, livelihood, and scholarship programs. The government says DAP was sourced from savings and was meant to boost government spending. But legal experts criticize DAP, saying it is unconstitutional and undermined Congress's power of the purse. Statements of pork barrel scam whistleblowers and former heads of implementing agencies show senators, staff members were closely involved in the release of lawmakers' pork barrel. Principal whistleblower Ben Herloy asks, says aides served as the link of alleged pork barrel scam mastermind Janet Limnopoulos to some senators. Lawyer Rodolfo Noel Kimbo says each senator has his or her own internal arrangement for staff handling the Priority Development Assistance Fund or the PADAF. While the chief of staff and political officers are usually 
in charge of the PADAF. Kimbo says this is not a requirement. He adds, theoretically, even the janitor can be made in charge of the PADAF. It depends on trust. The Senate Legislative Budget Research and Monitoring Office, or LBRMO, screens PADAF documents to check if the senator's proposed projects comply with the guidelines of the Budget Department. Louis says that in the scam, Napolis employees draft the listing and the staff they connived with would edit the documents and submit to the LBRMO. A Senate staff member who spoke with Rappler says it's usually their principals, their senator, who sign the letter addressed to the LBRMO. Defense Secretary Voltaire Gasmin says negotiations to grant the United States more access to Philippine military bases reach an impasse. The Philippine panel opposes the U.S. panel's condition limiting the access of Filipino troops to temporary facilities that American troops will be building once the access deal is signed. Gasmin says it should not be limited to them. We want equal opportunity and equal access. The military-to-military -military agreement is expected to boost the defense capability of the armed forces of the Philippines. Defense Undersecretary Pio Lorenzo Batino says the fourth round of talks on October 3 was a difficult round because of disagreements on what he called critical provisions. The setback is expected to delay the agreement. Batino says the two panels narrowed down the framework agreement to five key provisions, scope, agreed installations, Prepositioning of pre-positioning of defense equipment, ownership, and security. The panels have yet to agree on the time frame of the agreement. Similar agreements typically last 20 years, but the Philippines wants a shorter time frame. The Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs, or DFA, says it wants to consult the woman who exposed the alleged abuse of Filipino workers in Saudi Arabia. In a press briefing, Foreign Secretary Albert Del Rosario says government teams made the rounds of detention cells and police stations in Saudi Arabia, but did not see abuses against Filipinos. There is no report as uh, articulated by a lady who has uh, come home to say that uh, they were crowded in a detention cell and uh, they were uh, actually uh, chained. Uh, we did not see that and uh, that's why we are looking to talk to this lady uh, or seeking her out uh, so that uh, she can uh, provide us information uh, and we can validate it. Overseas workers group Migrante urges the government to, quote, to study the filing of a diplomatic protest over the allegations. On Monday, Filipino workers expelled from Saudi Arabia said they were abused after a crackdown on illegal workers there. A report by Ajans France Press quotes at least two women who said police rounded them up and placed them in a crowded cell for four days. Saudi Arabia began a crackdown on illegal workers after an extended grace period lapsed last Sunday. Saudi Arabia issues new rules banning the return of deported foreigners. The Philippine Embassy in Riyadh published the rules Monday after Saudi Arabia's deadline for workers to legalize their status. These rules will affect thousands of illegal workers in Saudi Arabia, the country with the highest number of overseas Filipino workers. The Philippine government says it repatriated 4,587 illegal workers from Saudi Arabia. That's only 49% of the 9,000 Filipinos who originally sought repatriation. Citing Philippine statistics in 2012, the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, says 24.4% of OFWs work in Saudi Arabia. The Philippine Embassy urges Filipinos, quote, to familiarize themselves with the new rules. Starting Sunday, illegal workers face up to two years in prison and fines of at least 100,000 rial or 27,000 U.S. dollars. Well, let's now look at Rappler's wrap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number three, the Philippines will adopt Japan's digital TV standard over Europe's rival version as it shifts from analog to digital television. The National Telecommunications Commission says the Philippines will soon use Japan's integrated service digital broadcasting terrestrial standard. The system has the technology to alert viewers during disasters or emergencies. It can also send alerts to mobile phones. Major TV networks spent billions to prepare for the shift to digital TV, with ABS-CBN shelling out 2 billion pesos, GMA almost a billion pesos, and TV5 500 million pesos. At number six, 
Interpol is waiting for evidence from Dutch authorities after a children's rights group identified a thousand pedophiles by offering online sex with a computer-generated 10-year-old girl. On Monday, the group Terra de Homes says it deployed a computer-generated Filipina they named Sweetie to snare web predators on internet chat rooms. Within 10 weeks, over 20,000 predators from 71 countries approached Sweetie. The group wants to raise the alarm about a new form of child exploitation known as webcam child sex tourism. And at number seven, previously unknown masterpieces stolen by the Nazis are recovered in a flat in Munich. The artworks by modernist painters Mark Chagall and Otto Dix are found in the apartment of Cornelius Gerlitt, son of a prominent Nazi-era art dealer who acquired the paintings in the 1930s and 1940s. 1,285 unframed and 121 framed paintings, sketches, and prints, some dating back to the 16th century, were found in the apartment. The estimated value of the treasure trove, $1.3 billion. For the full top 10, visit Rappler.com's The Wrap. Every story on Rappler has a mood meter, which gives you eight emotions to choose from. Click how you feel and your vote comes down to the mood navigator in the middle of the front page. That crowdsources the mood of the day. It also gives you the top 10 stories that have affected our readers and our viewers the most. These 10 stories in the last 24 hours have gotten the most number of votes on their mood meter. If we take a look today, the story that's gotten the most number of votes is this one posted just late last night. Netizens on Arnold Clavio, hashtag Major Rude on, on an interview done around this time about 24 hours ago, 27% angry, 61% annoyed, that purple um, overshadowing this 27% angry. But that red is also mirrored in stories like this, a Rappler exclusive by, at, by Miriam Grace Go, The Wealth of Old Man Revilla, whopping 78% angry. That red, as you can see, even in this one, Typhoon Haiyan moves closer to the Philippines. You have 65% afraid, but still 4% angry. That red reflected in the mood of the day. Today, most people are angry. Well, that's Rappler's newscast for today, Wednesday, November 6, 2013. Visit Rappler.com and watch our newscast Monday to Friday. Tell us how you feel on our mood meter and help us crowdsource the mood of the day. I'm Maria Ressa. As we say at Rappler, tomorrow begins today. We leave you with excerpts from the first of a three-part series, Rappler's lead up to the Pacquiao Rios fight. Nung nakita kung tinama, tinamaan niya si Marquez. Okay. Uh, nakita kung gusto niyang kunin, so tumunog yung tumunog yung 10 seconds. Pag tunog ng 10 seconds, uh, nung tinamaan niya ito Marquez, gusto niyang pasukin kaagad kasi kita niya grogi na eh, tinamaan ng solid. Eh. The date was December 8, 2012. Filipino boxing superstar Manny Pacquiao was back in the ring. It was his fourth showdown against Mexican arch rival Juan Manuel Marquez. Ang problema lang talaga is uh, nangyari ang hindi dapat mangyari, uh, hindi, yung, hindi natin ginusto na mangyayari, which is a part of, uh, of boxing. The loss clearly affected the national hero. Arriving in Manila, he apologized to Filipinos. Nag-sorry ako nun kasi, siyempre, ang angad ng Pilipino na mapasaya ko sila at magbigyan sila ng karangalan kaya lang. Siyempre, hindi natin ginusto yung nangyari. A knockout is a lot to get over for a fighter. It's not forgotten, but the fight is no longer spoken of in Pacquiao's training camp today. Ay, hindi na kasi, kung, kung isipin mo na, na naalala ko, Pero, ah, tapos na yun eh. Kumbaga sa ano, I have to move on. In this camp, past is past. All eyes are on the future. Is the fight against 27-year-old Brandon Rios his comeback fight? It's a, it's a you know, must-win situation, I feel, and to get back in to where Manny wants to be in it. And it's a pound for pound top ten. We, I, I, I definitely think we have to be impressive, and we need, we need a knockout to win, to win in this in good fashion. Pacquiao says he's ready. Ah, uh, hindi walang kaba kundi excited ang nararamdaman. Katulad ng ginagawa ko yon. Eh, happy ako dahil matagal na ko na yung pagkuhaw ako sa sa training and sa fight. 
Pacquiao returns to the ring on November 24 in Macau. Does he still have what it takes to win?